Assalamu alaikum dear viewers, welcome to the Bayt al Khadib channel. Uh, this is a series on the Nawasib movement, uh, where we will be analysing them from their noble beginnings through to their development over time. Uh, we'll analyse who they are, their sphere of influence and their achievements. Um, the reason that we felt that it was important to discuss this topic is because we do have individuals uh, uh, on the other side uh, which have tried their utmost to downplay who the Nawasib were and almost present them as in, uh, irrelevant individuals with no sphere um, of uh, um, the Sunni school of thought. That couldn't be further from the truth. And inshallah ta'ala, this series will evidence that. So, Bismillah rahman rahim All right, so now that we saw the whole history of Nasb, let's move on to a more contemporary scholar. Um, his name is Ibrahim Suleiman Jabhan. And I honestly must say this some of the most stupid nonsense that I've ever read in my life. Like when I read this the first time, I had to read it more than twice to really believe that what he says is said there. And it actually was taken out in a later version. We'll come to that. But uh, in the original version of his book he wrote, now I've not revealed a secret if I say that Jafar ibn Muhammad, meaning Imam Sadiq salam, was the brightest star chosen by the masonry groups, linking him to Freemasonry. It is indeed proven that he was one of those lines that the masonry devils counted upon and pushed him to achieve the caliphate. And the fact that Shia books are in consensus and that his resources points very clear to this fact that the mentioned person, Imam Sadiq salam, was the second founder of the Shia creed after the enemy of Allah, Ibn Saba al-Yahud. So he's actually comparing Imam Salih salam to Ibn Saba, that he was the one who turned Tashayu from a political movement to a religious creed. And he, with the help of those devils and their support, implanted the roots of his heinous crime. And this left for the followers a spring that a silk of poisons does not dry up. And he's also through the strict, strict secrecy that he's obliged to supporters, agents, and bearers of this doctrines to keep, and also through his drastic orders to keep Tahrir, and to put on every color, which does not leave any place of doubt that between Tashayu and Masonry, there's a strange alignment. All right. <laughs> All right. This is, like, this is ridiculous. Like, I mean, it's interesting to hear that people can actually have these kind of thoughts, but this is so wicked and stupid. And yeah, to mention the book, this is from uh, Tabdib al Dalam wa uh, Tambih al Niyam, published in 1979. And um, here's something um, slightly different from a later version, where he uh, where he basically says um, the same, but he basically doesn't mention his name. Where he says, uh, "I have not revealed a secret that if I say that some of the Shia Imams." Which is also interesting, like he doesn't limit it to Imam Sadiq there, alayhi salam. But um, now he says that some of the Shia Imams were of the brightest stars chosen by the masonry groups. I, I, I didn't even know they had Freemasons back then, but okay. Because the masonry devils counted up upon, pushed them to achieve the caliphate, and the fact that they were the ones who turned to Shayu from a political movement to religious creed. And yeah, it goes on. The way he said it before, and which he also changed, is this part here, which does not leave any place of doubt that between Tashayu and Masonry, then strange alignment it's from uh, the same book, but from a different version, which was published in 1989. So, in the same book, Ibrahim as Suleiman al Japan says, this is Ali, who says, uh, this is Ali, alayhi salam, he ruled for five years or more, and the people during his reign didn't eat or drink other than the blood of innocent people, the sweat of weak people, and the tears of women, orphans, and poor people. Like what? I, <laughs> he's making Imam Ali, alayhi salam, responsible for the whole uh, fitna that was present in that time due to the... Uh, due to, Due to the hatred and hostility towards Amir Mukmin, he's making him responsible for that, right? And that's from the same book. Then we have Adahabi, famous scholar, um, quoted uh, interestingly 
about um, Ibn Abi Dawood that Ibn, Ibn Uday said in the beginning he, like Ibn Abi Dawood, was fairly Nasibi. It was very interesting. Mizan is from Mizan al Etidal, volume 4. Page 114. We have another episode where actually at one point all hell broke loose because um, the Rawafid had the audacity to uh, to quote something that is actually found in Sunni books too, but let's leave that aside for now. Like they had the extreme audacity to set um, to to set up a stone. Like let's read the tradition. It's from Ibn Kathir. And uh, it's in um, it's in this, uh, Abidaya Wan Nihaya history book uh, on the year 443 in the year of Hijra during the month of Safar. A brawl broke out between Rabawfid and Al Sunnah, and a lot of people died from both sides. And the reason was that Rabawfid put up a stone with these words written in gold Muhammad and Ali are the best of creatures. And whosoever accepts it, he has committed the noble act of thanking Allah. Whosoever rejects it, has uh, has rejected or has committed kufr. And therefore, the Ahl Sunnah got really incensed that the Rawafid equated Ali alayhi salam with the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Um, yeah, how dare they? <laughs> how dare they quote this tradition they also have in their own sources? And so um, they started a fight. A fight broke up. And it lasted till Rabi al Awad. And it resulted in one Hashemite being killed, who was buried near to the grave of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And when Ahl Sunnah were done with burial, they looted the shrine of Imam Qasim alayhi salam, and they burned the tomb of Imam Qasim alayhi salam and Imam Muhammad Taqi, uh, Muhammad Taqi alayhi salam. And moreover, Ahl Sunnah also burned the graves of Alay Boya, Wazirs. Jafar ibn Mansur, Muhammad al Amin, and his mother Zubayya, and a lot of other graves were burnt down, and a fight broke out, and Rawafid retaliated with equal back crimes, etc. Et so, like, what the hell? <laughs> like, they, I mean, they, to be fair, there were times, I, I forgot where exactly this is quoted, where a lot of Sunnis used to um, make pilgrimage and still do and until this day. Some, some Sunnis do that pilgrimage to to the shrines of the holy imam but they actually destroyed it they burned it down like <laughs> unbelievable and this from uh, Badaya when volume 15 uh page 719 and what's next is a um, tradition from um from Imam Khadun, right uh the famous historian ibn, ibn khaldun says in his work uh, Al Muqaddama, Introduction to the History of the World, Volume 3, page 45, he says, And the Ahl Bayt deviated, like <laughs> the Ahl Bayt deviated, or created sects that they formed and fiqh that they came up with by themselves, which they built upon attacking some of the Sahaba and by saying that the Imams والسلام, are infallible and uh, all that are baseless. They matched the Kharji and the general public of Muslims did not celebrate or endorse such sects, but rather denied them. So we do not recognize their sects, nor do we narrate anything from their books. Their narrations have no impact, except in their own lands like Yemen, Morocco, interestingly, mm -hmm. back then, and the East. Yeah, so that's Ibn Khaldun for that part. Um, Ibn Khaldun also said in the Muqaddama, in... Um, uh, page 577, that the Alids, the Alawiyun, the Alids invented their own school and had their own jurisprudence. They based it upon their dogma requiring abuse of some of the men around Muhammad and والسلام, and upon their stated opinion concerning the infallibility of the Imams and the inadmissibility of differences in their statements. All these are futile uh, principles. The Kharijites similarly had their own school. The great mass did not care for these unorthodox schools, but greatly disapproved of them and abused them. 
nothing is known of the opinions of these schools. Their books are not being transmitted. No trace of them can be found except in regions inhabited by these sectarians. The legal textbooks of the Shia are thus found in Shia countries and wherever Shia dynasties exist in the West, the East, and in Yemen. The same applies to the Kharijites. All of them have legal writings and books and hold strange opinions and jurisprudence. Um, which is also a very interesting statement because I um, think that um, think that most of our uh, fiqh positions uh, could be backed up by the one or one or another opinion of any classic Sunni school, which, which doesn't play a role anyway if you look at these major disagreements that uh, the Sunni schools have in their uh, jurisprudence. One conclusion we can get from that is that, um, at least Ibn Khaldun, is uh, pretty convinced and clear about um, the Ahlul Bayt themselves um, having these ideas of uh, dissociating from certain companions and having, even having hatred towards them. And um, I mean, that gets people into some kind of conflict if they, that's really what they believe, then um, they would have a problem in that at the same time loving Ahlul Bayt and at the same time, um, having them very strongly rejecting and um, uh, opposing certain companions, which would be um, kind of a dilemma, right? So um, this is a major problem here. And uh, the problem with the conclusion that comes up if we, uh, if we follow Ibn Khaldun's argumentation in that regard, right? Okay, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Brother Daniel. So that really does uh, hit a point home. And it also stresses another, uh, I think it addresses another point that is a suggestion that Ibn Sabah was somehow involved in forging this concept of uh, infallibility and disassociation from the enemies of the Arabic. Ibn Khaldun places uh, the blame directly at the family of the Prophet themselves. So I, mean, I think the important thing here is what Ben Khaldun, he talks about history of, you know, the past. I mean, he's a, 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 you know, his analysis of history is very, very uh, respected. And, and his inter he very, very much lays the blame. He, he accuses the elites, the descendants of Amir al muminin of deviancy and sort of bringing concocting concepts such as Isma and uh, beliefs in about uh, disassociation, having negative views of the companions, I, I certain companions of the Prophet. Um, he, he, he places the door clearly at them. Now, on the one hand, you have to respect that that's their position. Come on. But on the one hand, you say that you respect Arabayda, uh, but then you, you also have uh, to accept that there's a position which they had, which diametrically opposed your school of thought. So how do you reconcile that? You, I mean, you can't blame Ibn Sabah here. Ibn the Khaldun is very, very clear. He, bl he apportions the blame directly at the descendants of Amir al Mu'manin, who believed in doctrines such as Islam, who believed about this concept about disassociating, being critical of certain individuals that they respect. So how do you deal with this situation? On the one hand, you, demand, you insist that you respect the family of the Prophet. And here we have Ibn Khaldun actually accusing them of deviancy and saying they're responsible for uh, this, uh, these concepts, deviant concepts, which is why we have nothing to do with them. So how do you reconcile that? You guys are in a catch-22 situation. You, you can't have both. You can't say we respect them and love them and then also have a position such as that Ibn Khaldun is very clear of, that they are actually accused of uh, bringing deviancy, um, uh, in, basically uh, infecting the religion with incorrect beliefs. So how do you address that then? How do you respect them? Well, about I, I think... Kind of uh, Sambari, that would kind of explain also at the same time how they turned into Naspis as well to some extent. So now we're going to come to some even more um, well-known uh, scholars within the uh, Sunnah or Jama'ah, well, in particular in the Salafi school. Is the famous Ibn Taymiyyah, who says in Minhaj al-Sunnah, volume 7, page number 137-138, um, the fourth issue is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had informed the Prophet and peace and blessing be upon him that he would create love for those who believe and do righteous deeds. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only create love for those who do, who believe in the righteous deeds. Then he says this promise was true and it was well known that Allah created love for the Sahaba in the heart of every Muslim, especially the Khalifas. May Allah be pleased with them, especially Abu Bakr and Umar. 
he didn't mention Osman here. Uh, but anyway, this is because the genera generality of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een loved both of them, Abu Bakr and Umar. And these were the best of generations. Then he says, this was not the case for Ali. That is because the majority of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een hated, cursed, and for him. So this is proof that this hatred um, is something which stemmed from within the camps of the Sahaba themselves his opposition that they had against Imam al Islam, uh, which later went to the Tabi'een, uh, who did what? Who hated, cursed, and fought him. So the practice of cursing Imam al Islam came from the Sahaba themselves. And it's the majority. The majority. Majority. And what is the sign of a hypocrite? Hatred of Imam Ali. So what does that tell you? Yeah, so, so that's part of You've noticed something. It's very crucial. He says, he would, he says the Prophet said that Allah would create love for those who believe and do righteous deeds. So then what is he trying to say about Imam Ali Islam, indirectly? Absolutely. It is, he does draw a lot of inferences in his writings. You can read between the lines. And it certainly and, says, and, you know, you can see the respect he has for the Shaykh Khan, but he certainly doesn't have that level of respect for Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salatu wa salam. Mm. And it's a link, and he's, he's very, very clear. He's saying that Sahaba hated him, majority of them. So... You know, what's the issue then? If we, for example, have an issue with Sahaba, you should, you, you, you get offended straight away, but you don't mind the fact that you're, those that you respect, you see the best of generations, they bore grudge against him, you know, me. They hated him. The majority of them hated him. And yet, well, we can't be critical of that position. And, and it's interesting because based on the fact of what Ibn Taymiyyah said regarding Imam Ali, Ibn Hajr Asqalani in his book Al-Durur Al-Kamina, volume 1, page number 154. Uh, he says, and among them, the Sunni scholars, were those who accused him, Ibn Taymiyyah, of hypocrisy. Due to his statement about Imam Ali, that we have mentioned on the account of his statement that he, Ali Islam, was humiliated wherever he turned, and that he, Ali, repeatedly sought the Khilafa, but did not get it. And he... Ali fought only for power and not for the religion. And due to Ibn Taymiyyah's statement that he Ali loved power while Usman loved money. And on the account of Ibn Taymiyyah's, Ibn Taymiyyah's statement that Abu Bakr accepted Islam as an adult who knew what he was saying, well, Ali accepted it as a child. And the Islam of a child uh, upon this statement is invalid. So he even doubted the acceptance of Islam of Imam Ali Islam. Let's come to the next quote. This is from Lisan al Mizan, volume 8. Page number 551, 552. And he says, Ibn Hajj Shkalani, he, Ibn Taymiyyah, also rejected many good narrations who, when writing the book, didn't provide the references from where the narrations were taken. Because of, because of his good memory, he relied on what he memorized. While a, a human often accounted for uh, forgetting, and the exaggeration in refuting the Rafa text has sometimes taken him towards degrading Muhammad Islam. So in order to refute the Shias, he would really go to such measures of belittling Imam al-Islam. This is why scholars from Al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah accused Ibn Simi of being a Nasbi, a hypocrite, for the simple fact that he used to degrade the Ahl Bayt al-Islam. Even when it comes to the Hadith of Fazail or Virtue, etc., you know, he would look to, you know, his level best to try to weaken it. Let's come to another quote. This is from Ibn Timi again. He says, we know what's narrated about the evil deeds of Fatima Aslam Aleha and other apart from her, from the Sahaba, including telling lies, are several. And in some of, uh, of these evil deeds, they, uh, meaning Fatima Aslam Aleha and other Sahaba, were only doing Tawil. Of course, some of these evil deeds were sins. However, they're not infallible. Rather, although they were uh, friends of Allah and from the people of Jannah, they committed sins that Allah forgave them. This is from Nahaj al-Sunnah, Nabawiyah, volume 4, page number 243, 244. That's shocking. That's shocking. He's actually accusing Sayyidah Fatima Islam Aleha of telling lies. And this is from uh, um, a more of a sort of contemporary scholar who commented on this particular statement of Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, he, say, he says, uh, Mahmoud al-Sayyid, he says, I do not know which several evil deeds were narrated for about Sayyidah Fatima Islam Aleha, much less, uh, less telling lies, or which evil deeds in which she was doing tawil, meaning that Fatima Islam Aleha was doing tawil or reports in which she is stated to have committed sins and which liar has narrated such reports? This is book Akhtar uh, ibn Taymiyyah. So this book, this scholar, Muhammad al-Sayyid, 
has criticized Ibn Taymiyyah's statement saying, look, I don't even know what lies he's accusing the blessed daughter, may peace and blessings be um, upon her. There we have it. So we have individuals. These are these people that insist that uh, they are the lovers of Arab Bayt, alayhi salatu wa salam, and their their scholars um, always were the standard bearers of, of uh, when it comes to supporting them. We have their lead scholars, lead lead scholars, reputed ones, attacking them, uh, and particularly Ibn Taymiyyah. It's, it's important to point out that uh, Ibn Baz uh, did actually say that Ibn Taymiyyah, if we obviously we're not prophet, would come to an end. Had it not come to an end, then uh, you know Ibn Demir had those sort of signs, which were essentially those of would be prophet. And look at this individual, this uh, you know individual with such elevated position, is attacking Sayyidah Sarah Salam and uh, we don't even know what lies he's attributing to her, but he's suggesting it. And this is part and par parcel of these people. On the one hand, they insist that they defend that um, they are the standard bearers of the Al Bayt and their scholars always respected them and, and um, uh, they were at the vanguard, um, at the forefront of dealing with the Nawasim. So what we've covered today is we've talked about how uh, on the, the scholars uh, of the al Sunnah wal Jama'ah have uh, had nasb in their writings, the way that they've attacked Imam Ali alayhi salam, Sayyidah Zara salam alayhi Imam Hussain alayhi salatu wa salam, and the family of Imam Ali alayhi salam in general. And they've made very, very negative con uh, comments, highly critical of these blessed personalities. So if they are going to insist that there's no concept of nasb amongst their elders, amongst their scholars, or their pens have nasb in it. Uh, no, alhamdulillah, we've evidenced this for our audience. So when you hear individuals insisting that they, they, no such thing existed, the truth is very, very different. I think that concludes things on our side. Uh, remember, I said in your du'as, as we shall remember you. Salaamu alaikum.